Amen. We stood together in the kitchen the other day. Lorraine had three toothpicks of different sizes. She had broken them off. We were drawing straws or toothpicks. None of us wanted to do this job, but the one who got the shortest one would lose and be the one picked by this committee of three to perform the task. So she put them in her hands strategically and Caleb and I both drew one, leaving Lorraine with the shortest. Lorraine would have to clean out the microwave. <laughs> That was the task. So how's your microwave these days? Do you ever find it getting stuff in it that really wasn't intended to be in it? You ever forget to cover stuff like goulash and eggs? Yeah, um, yeah. Leanne points to Brad. Yeah, he forgets that. <laughs> or, or you put loose hamburger in there to heat it up and you forget. And, it, it's, and, and at first it's not a big deal because, oh, there's just a little bit. I'll clean that up later, right? You ever do that? I'll clean that up later. Well, later doesn't come for a while, and it begins to accumulate. And finally, it reaches the point where, you know, let's draw straws to see who's going to clean this thing out. And then we get it all cleaned out, and we, we swear a vow, okay, we're covering everything. We're never going to let it get to that point again. Kind of sounds like our spiritual lives a bit, doesn't it? You ever have that happen, spiritually speaking, where... Yeah, at first it starts out, it's no big deal. There's some clutter in there. And you think, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to, I'm going to get that cleaned up. But you let it go. And you put some other stuff and you're exposed to different things. And it begins to build up. And then it gets to the point where it's kind of depressing. Well, I could never get back to that point again. And you're just kind of down and out. And, and you need a complete overhaul, but you don't want to do it. Until finally... God encounters you in such a way that you're going to allow God to clean it up, to start fresh again. It happens. We drift in these things. And we're dealing with this week, week number six, in a six-week series on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We called it Immersed in Ephesians. And we've learned that the first three chapters dealt with who we were in Christ, who we are in Christ, positional realities. That the last three chapters have dealt with how to live that out in practical ways. How to live life better as Christians, as followers, with husbands and wives, with employers and employees, in our daily regimen of living. How does it look to be Christian? Well, in this sixth chapter, Paul concludes his thoughts with helping us contextualize our Christian walk. That we are indeed living in a world where there is conflict where there are strategies that are aligned against us and that we have to be aware of that. And that the very context for living out a Christian life is understanding that there are things against us, that we are really going upstream or walking up a down escalator in living out this Christian life. And so if we don't experience a whole lot of resistance, it may be because we're swimming with all the other fish instead of the, the salmon, or we're going down the escalator with everyone else instead of resisting that process. So Paul says this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord. This is Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Be strong in the Lord and in his power or mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Let's pluck a couple of those things out. All of God's armor. Paul was in prison when he wrote this, probably under house arrest. Certainly would have had a Roman soldier assigned to him, probably different ones, either on a weekly or maybe even a daily basis. He might have even been chained to them. He makes reference to chains. So he might have been chained or he might have been chained to the soldier. We don't really know, but, but certainly he was bound and his limits were, uh, his movements were limited. But he had lots of time to ponder and reflect on the Christian life lived out in this house arrest or prison. And so as he studied the Roman soldier and his armor, he drew parallels. 
as to how we are to live our lives, that as the soldier is meticulous about putting on the armor of God and keeping it in a fresh way, we as believers need to be meticulous about putting the armor of God on. And the reason we do so is to stand firm against all strategies of the devil, Diablo, the diabolic one we could translate it and maybe register to our thinking even a little better. To stand firm against all the strategies of the diabolic one. The one who comes to steal, Jesus said, kill and destroy. His threefold mission, steal, kill and destroy. And we are the focus because of Jesus. We as the church become that focus. Paul continues by saying this. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to, to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Put on the, and then he gives us six different things from verses 14 through 17, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, which can be the renewing of the mind to the things of God, and the sword of the spirit, which he tells us is the word of God. It's interesting that five of the pieces of armor are defensive, and only one is offensive, the sword of the spirit. Everything else is to defend ourselves, and the one is to use as an, as, as an offensive weapon. So the armor of God, truth and righteousness and peace and faith and salvation and the sword of the Spirit. So Paul draws this parallel that that's how we as Christians are to live in this world where there is conflict. So there are a couple of truths we need to be aware of. Number one, Christianity was birthed in the context of conflict. It was birthed as a faith in the context of conflict. Think about Herod. What were his feelings about Jesus? They weren't buddies, were they? Herod was out to get Jesus, to kill him. That's called conflict. Probably none of us here had people after us when we were put into the, into the hospital carrier, right? None of us were, were targets of an evil king. But Jesus was. Because our faith is birthed in the context of conflict. Most of us in this room have not suffered the persecution that some of our brothers and sisters in the Congo are, or in China, or in Pakistan, or, other, or Iraq, or other regions of the world are suffering. We may have people look bad at us, may have them tease us a little bit, but for the most part, it feels like a lot of the times we're all kind of going in the stream together. And it's hard to distinguish ourselves from the flow of the world, but persecution changes that. If someone says, you renounce him or you die, it pretty quickly changes our sense of faith in the context of conflict. For the first 300 years, roughly, the church was in the, in, in the grips of that conflict with the Roman Empire. It never happened all over the empire all at once, but in pockets and regions of the empire, almost continuously, there were outbursts of persecution against the Christians. It might go something like this. You might live in harmony with your neighbor. Your neighbor's a, 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 a polytheist, a pagan, believes in worshiping the multiplicity of gods, but especially calling Caesar Lord. Caesar required homage to himself, that he was the son of God. You must say Caesar is Lord. When you go into the temple, you burn incense, you bow down, Caesar is Lord, and then you can believe whatever you want. Christians couldn't do that. Well, you might live in harmony with your neighbor for a season, but if your neighbor got mad at you because you mowed three feet over onto his yard, or your tree's growing over his, you're not picking up your plums, whatever that might be, he can turn you in, and all he has to do is accuse you of being a Christian. And you're brought before the, before the uh, authorities, and they will ask you, and they will ask you to renounce your Christian faith, renounce that Jesus is Lord. And you'll say no, and so you'll either be in prison and killed or just in prison, but you're going to be taken away from your family. And your life is going to be in peril. Because Christianity was birthed in the context of conflict. But 314, the Edict of Milan, Constantine, the emperor, 
who perhaps was a Christian, certainly sympathetic to the cause and certainly a masterful strategist, he essentially makes eventually the Roman Empire a Christian empire. So suddenly your pagan neighbor who's a polytheist is told, well, you either in order to succeed in society here, to climb the ladder economically in this community, if you ever want to be mayor, then you are going to have to be baptized and call yourself a Christian. And he thinks about five seconds and says, okay, I can do that. I'll just switch Caesar is Lord to Jesus is Lord. And I'll be one of them. And it was a pretty simple process if you were willing to be baptized. The problem was the, the bar, the standard of what it meant to be Christian quickly began to plummet. And mediocrity began ruling the day. So there were groups of people, groups of Christians, who thought, we don't want this. There is, there is more to living out our Christian life than, than this. And so many of them started departing and going into the, the desert areas, what, what the Bible called the, the wilderness areas, but the, the barren parts, away from the cities. And they would start living out a very disciplined life of prayer, of fasting, of study, and meditation in the Word, and of outreach. And that became their daily regiment, their discipline, and then others joined them. So these became cloister groups. Then they would go into the cities and they would minister to people. But oftentimes those who would come to Christ were invited then to become a part of a cloistered community that was going to take seriously what it meant to live in Christ because they recognized that though there is not persecution, there is still conflict. There's an enemy of our soul that would try to pull us into this mediocrity and we want to, in the name of Christ, resist that. Because it, it is awareness of this conflict, the second truth, it is awareness of this conflict with evil strategies that readies us for resistance. Now the opposite or the inverse would be true. That our lack of awareness of this conflict tends to cause us to become a little lax with our Christian faith because, well, does it really matter? I mean, we've been baptized, we've said the magic words, yeah, I've accepted Jesus into my life, going to heaven, isn't everything good? I can just live my life. And they would say, no, it's not that way. There is still an enemy of our soul. And that very mindset of taking it in such a glib way is, is the fruit of someone actually being pulled away from the things of God, even though they're giving lip service to it, like the pagan neighbor. It is awareness of this conflict with evil strategies that readies us for resistance. Let me ask you this. Those of you who are into sports, I've never been great at sports, but I've always liked sports. And I've played in a number of sports, never achieved greatness, but I still like it and I follow it. Let me ask you this about sports. Those of you who really are sports enthusiasts and you play, you've actively played or you play now. You'd have fun. We used to play lots of uh, ball in, the, in our yards. Just We'd call them pickup games and basketball pickup games, we'd call them. But then later on, things became very organized. But let me ask you this. Would you have trouble getting a coach if you were never going to play any games? It was all just about, well, just come and watch us just kind of have fun playing in the gym as we shoot baskets. You meet as a coach, you want me to just come and stand there for an hour watching you just shoot some baskets. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get very excited about that, frankly, right? Because it's the idea that we're going to go up against an opponent. Competition. We've got to prepare ourselves at a higher level. Sam, you know, think about football. If it were just about, well, we, just, we want you to come to practice, Sam, and we want you to run, do those laps, work out and all of that. Well, when's the game? Well, we're not playing any games. We just want you to come. And would you, wouldn't you just love that? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, wouldn't that be great? All that football, but there's no game. There's no one we're really preparing. There's no resistance. We're just doing that. It's a little hard to get Christians to pay the price for intercessory prayer, for study and meditation, for living a life Christ-centered, when there's really no awareness of much resistance here. Everything's kind of cool. But when we begin to be aware that there's an opponent, and some of our very laxness is a fruit of that opponent actually winning the day in our thinking processes, then we can become aware and awakened to the fact that, no, this is a spiritual strategy. 
The very thing that I'm now thinking, eh, it's no big deal, yeah, I've said the magic words, I'll go to heaven someday, that in itself was a lie. The whole thinking process is wrong because there is a conflict of eternal proportions in which we are engaged as Christians. So what is our goal? What is our goal? I mean, in basketball, you know, the idea you, 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 you're resisting one opponent, that opponent's resisting you, you're trying to make baskets. In soccer, you're trying to score some goals. In tennis, you're making points and you want to win match point and all of this. So we have a clear defined goal in sports. So there's a reason to work out. There's a reason to, to discipline your bodies to achieve certain things. But in Christianity, if we don't recognize that, it's very hard to get motivated. What's our goal? And, and we could name lots of different things. I suspect they'll have parts of this component in them. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting to you this is a perfect definition. But it's one definition that I think at least captures some of what our goal is, our daily goal. To live a Christ-centered life through God-awareness, alignment, and action. If we're not God-aware at some point, if we're not God-aligned at some point, and if our actions are not motivated by God at some point, then we're just sort of like someone saying, I'm a football player, but all we really do is wear a jersey, and we never show up for practice, and we never grunt it out, and we never you know, resist any opponents. We just have a jersey on them. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But we don't quite get it that this involves daily discipline, or what one person has called daily watchfulness, to live a Christ-centered life through God awareness, alignment, and action in everything that we do. So that that little interaction at the coffee shop at work, where someone just sort of saying something that's pulling you into a certain way of thinking or talking and yucking it up, but something on the inside is like that microwave. Oops, there's some splatter on the inside. Didn't see that coming. But if we're not aware that this is a part of the strategy here, then we sort of let it go. And, and then we, we go home and we flip on some things and some of this stuff is, ooh, I better not watch that, but I'm gonna come back to it and watch it just a little bit longer. And, uh, you know, maybe it'll change. No, nope, it's not changing. I'm going to flip. Oh, I'm going to come back and watch that just a little bit more. And our microwave just gets more clutter on it. We think, well, I'm going to come back and deal with that later. But we don't because we're not keenly aware that this is a strategy here. There is, there is actually a, a, a dark one, an enemy, a, a hierarchy that's involved in pulling us either directly, probably most of the time indirectly, into a systemic way of thinking and living and moving where we never challenge the status quo in our Christian lives because we've said the magic formula, we're wearing the jersey, we've got it together, now we're just going to enjoy life until we go to heaven. To live a Christ-centered life through God awareness, alignment, and action takes daily watchfulness. We don't do it perfectly. But if we do, we will sense the resistance to that. We will feel at times that we are going up a down escalator. We are swimming up against the stream. We will sense that and feel that in our lives. So here's some tools that thwart us in this process. We know who our enemy is in soccer, right? In basketball and baseball and football. We understand. You know, they're, they're dressed in certain ways, but that's the enemy. We're stopping them. They're trying to stop us. What are the tools used in the strategies of evil to keep us from living a Christ-centered life that's aware, aligned, and active for God? That being the goal. Well, I think there are three things of which lots of other things fit in them. But these are three Bible categories. Lots of stuff fit in these. Fear, and that drives us away. Deception, and that draws us away. And accusation, that shames us away. All from the divine center of Christ. You want to know what keeps me from walking a Christ-centered life? God-aware, God-aligned, God-acting it out. What keeps me from that? Fear. Deception, accusation. Those are the three primary tools that the schemes of the, of the evil one uses. Fear drives me away. It may be through rejection. It may be through circumstances in my life. Something that creates angst, anxiety, worry, 
fear to the point that I'm not centered. I'm over here and my microwave of my heart's getting all cluttered up and I have drifted from my goal of living Christ-centered today because fear is driving me from that and I'm succumbing to that. There's a reason that 366 times we're told the Bible says don't fear, fear not in some different way. Fear not, Isaiah 41.10 says, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will help you, strengthen you, uphold you with my righteous hand. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. There is a reason that God gives us all of these passages on not being afraid. Because fear is such a huge tool used to drive us from our goal of living a Christ-centered life. Deception. Deception doesn't drive us away. It draws us away. It entices us away. It may be distractions. Jesus said in the parable of the sower that the, the thorns or the weeds of this world, they wrap themselves around the word. And he said those things that choke the word off are things like the deceitfulness of riches, the lust for other things. Just our very distractions with life. Martha, Martha, he said, you are troubled over many things. It wasn't that Martha shouldn't be a servant. Absolutely not. Thank goodness for the Marthas of this world. It was that in that moment, the pots and pans gained the focus rather than the very Son of God who was in her midst. It was, it was the shifting of the eye from the inner gaze of Christ to the circumstances. It was sinking in the sea like Peter because he took his eyes off of Jesus and got them on the circumstances. That was the problem. Deception draws us away. Sometimes Lust are basically things that in the right context are actually good things. In fact, gifts of God. But, but distorted or perverted or done in excess, they become lust and destructive to the very center within our lives. And so those deceitful things draw us away. And it's so subtle. And it happens in such a way that you don't even see the microwave accumulating with this stuff because you're so busy and so involved in really good things. And sometimes that's the hardest part. It's the good stuff. But it's also good stuff that may be keeping me from being centered in the Christ, God aware, God aligned, and acting out my faith before God. And finally, accusation. Doesn't drive you away, doesn't draw you away, it shames you away. The accusation, the word Satan is a word literally that means accuser or slanderer. That's what the word Satan means, accuser or slanderer. And oftentimes that, that is the tactic employed. You're worthless. You're no good, you're hopeless. And that sense of worthlessness or hopelessness shames you away from the divine center. Oh, I could never draw near. I could never do what other people do. I could never accomplish that because I'm a nobody. Well, not according to God. According to God, he doesn't make junk. According to God, yeah, without him, we were dead in our sins. But with him, we have been raised up into heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that Christ-centered will speak to us one thing, but that shame base of accusation will speak to us another. And sometimes those, <clears throat> those tapes in our mind go over and over and over and over. You're no good, you're worthless, it's hopeless, you're never going to make it. And those tapes are from strategies that may be indirect, maybe it's come up through generations, maybe it's come up through through encounters at school, maybe it's come up through something that happened, an abuse even. We don't know. Different things cause it to happen, but those tapes are there. And it's only by drawing to a Christ-centered place and renewing the mind to who we really are in Christ that we can break free of that. Now, those are the tools that thwart. What about the tools used to thrive? What about the tools that we're to use in the, the game, if you will, the competition, the the conflict in which Christianity has been birthed. Pray. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray at all times in the Spirit. I think that means it involves some listening. It involves some discerning. That takes a while to cultivate that, and that's okay. That's okay. 
Sam, when you started out with football, I'm guessing you had to build up some muscle memory in some things. I'm guessing that the shape you're in today, you weren't in day one, right? That takes time. You gotta grunt it out. And people say, well, I get bored after two minutes. Well, that's part of grunting it out, just like Sam does in football. If Sam were to say to the, to the coach, well, I don't know, after two minutes, my stomach hurts. I'm sure the coach would break into tears right at that moment, right, Sam? He's getting you ready for a game. Well, beloved, I'm trying to get us ready for a game here. Only it's called a conflict with the evil strategies of this world. So we pray and we learn to pray and we practice prayer and we, we start over sometimes if, if, if we have to. But we are going to learn to pray at all times in the spirit because that's a tool that causes us to thrive in this world filled with conflict. Study. We could say meditate, we could say memorize, we could say soak in the word because it accurately, according to 2 Timothy, it accurately helps us explain the word of truth. We must be saturated with the truth of God's words and love. Love God and love your neighbor. Mark chapter 12, it's listed other places in the Gospels, but this is the great command. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the tools that we practice. They seem so basic. Just like football, just like soccer, just like basketball. When I played basketball, and again, I was lousy at basketball. I was, I was, I would, I told you this, I would sit on the bench and I would pray, literally pray that the coach would not send me in. That's how much I didn't want to go play basketball, right? But I was still out there practicing every day. And there are just certain basic things in basketball. You need to learn to pass the ball. You need to learn how to shoot the ball. You need to learn how to keep your body in front in defense so that you're not just trying to do it with your arms, but your legs become so important. Basic stuff like pray, study, love. I mean, this isn't, this isn't pizzazz type stuff. This is just, these are basic tools that as believers in a conflict, we have to learn how to walk in this. Prayer, study, love, daily watchfulness, every day, living out our goal of being Christ-centered by being God-aware, God-aligned, and acting in God. Hallelujah. So I pray, I pray that we'll not just wear a jersey, but that we are on the team and that we become keenly aware that we are having resistance, and that's okay. Because living out this Christian life is a whole lot like walking up an escalator that's going the opposite direction, it's going down. Walking up while others are going down, and what happens when you're doing that? Have you ever done that? I mean, as a kid, I used to do it uh, once in a while when mom and dad weren't around, but you know how most kids have done that? And what happens, those going down, they give you bad looks, don't they? Maybe they say something to you. You shouldn't be doing that, you need to turn around. Well, if you're doing that out of shields, that's true. But other places, spiritually speaking, though, those are some of the comments you may get, some of the looks you may get. That's okay. That's okay. Because we are living out and committed to live out this life. Our goal is to live a Christ-centered life through God awareness, God alignment, and God actions. Let's pray. Father, may we renew and recommit ourselves to that end with greater clarity as to this goal in our Christian life, that it is not just getting to heaven, but heaven, get, heaven getting into us. It is not just saying a formula, but living out of faith. It is not wearing a jersey, but it is living so engrafted in Jesus that it makes a difference. Give us the courage and the strength, the boldness, the tenacity, the love, to work through any resistance in order to work out this goal of living Christ-centered. We have been immersed in Ephesians. May we continue to be immersed in Jesus the Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.